Welcome to this lecture on part two of materialism. In the previous lecture, we talked about the Industrial Revolution and all of the changes in technology and architecture, and we finished up talking about the Impressionist and some of those famous artists of that Impressionist movement. In this lecture, we'll be talking about post-Impressionism, which is another movement. So, when we think about post-Impressionism, it encompasses a wide range of distinct artistic styles that all share the common motivation of responding to the opticality of that Impressionist movement. The stylistic variations are assembled under the general banner of post-Impressionism, and these range from the scientifically oriented Neo-Impressionism of Georges Seurat to the lush symbolism of Paul Gauguin. But all of these concentrated on that subjective vision of the artist. The movement ushered in an era during which painting transcended its traditional role as a window into the world. And instead, this became a window into the artist's mind and soul. These far-reaching aesthetic impacts of this post-impressionist group um, influenced other groups that arose during the turn of the 20th century, like the Impress Expressionist, as well as more contemporary movements like the identity-related feminist art. So you see on the slide um, that the post-Impressionist rejected the Impressionism's concern with the spontaneous and those naturalistic renderings of light and color. Instead, these post-impressionists favored the emphasis on a more symbolic type of content, formal order and structure. Um, post-impressionism was actually motivated by the decorative thrust of Art Nouveau, um, Japanese prints, and the value of art for art's sake. Now, Art Nouveau was that restoration of fine um, artisanship of that pre-industrial period. Um, there's this idea of finding art in nature um, and nature in art. So, we're going to see things like Tiffany art glass um, and the Paris Metro Station all being part of, you know, this post-impressionist uh, movement. All right, so one famous artist of this post-impressionist uh, movement is Van Gogh. And you see on the left, you know, a fame, he, he, he did several self-portraits of um, his likeness. And it is not, you know, it, it, it's, we all know that he suffered from mental illness. And so we see that decline in his mental illness in some of his self-portraits. On the right, um, you see one of his very famous pieces, Starry Night. And this is one of the most recognized pieces of art in the world. It's absolutely everywhere. Um, you can see it on coffee mugs, t-shirts, uh, mouse pads, magnets, towels, scarves. And honestly, it sometimes feels as if the painting's fame has exceeded that of its creator. Um, it's a magnificent piece of art. Um, Starry Night resonates with so many people as kind of a testament to how its beauty is timeless and universal. Now, there's a story behind this painting, Starry Night. It was painted by Vincent van Gogh in 1889 during his stay at the Asylum of St. Paul de Massol near the St. Remy de Provence. While he suffered from occasional relapse into paranoia and fits, officially he has been diagnosed with epileptic fits. Um, it seemed his mental health was recovering. Unfortunately, he had relapsed and he began to suffer hallucinations and have thoughts of suicide as he plunged deeper and deeper into depression. Accordingly, there was a tonal shift in his work. He returned to incorporating the darker colors from the beginning of his career, and Starry Night is that wonderful example of that shift. 
The blue dominates the painting, blending hills into the sky. The little village lays at the base in the painting in browns, grays, and blues. Even though each building is clearly outlined in black, <clears throat> the yellow and white of the stars and the moon in the sky stand out against that sky, drawing the eye to the sky itself. There's a big attention grabber of the painting. You see the brush strokes. Uh, for the sky, they twirl, and each dab of color rolling with the clouds around the stars and the moon. On the cypress tree, they bend with the curve of the branches, um, and the whole effect is very ethereal and dreamlike. The hills easily roll down into the little village below. Now, in contrast, the town is straight up and down, done with rigid lines that interrupt um, the flow of the brush strokes. Tiny little trees soften the inflexibility of the town, bringing the nature, nature into the unnaturalness of buildings. One of the biggest points of interest about this painting is that it came entirely from his imagination. None of this scenery matches the area surrounding St. Paul or the view from his window in the asylum. As a man who religiously paints what he sees, it's a remarkable break from his normal work. The contrast in styles plays on the natural versus the unnatural, um, kind of a dream versus reality. Nature could even be attributed to the divine in his work. In Genesis 37, 9, John, Joseph states, and he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made um, appearance to me, predicting that one day his family would bow to him as an authority. And some people associate this quote with this painting. Perhaps it's a reference to Van Gogh's family who doubted the success of his career with the notable exception of his brother. It could be said that Van Gogh simply wanted to breathe in the higher power of his art um, as he grew up in a religious household. Divide the painting into three parts. The sky is the divine. It is by far the most dreamlike, unreal part of the painting, beyond human comprehension and just out of reach. Go down one level to the cypress, the hills, and the other trees on the ground. They bend and they swirl, still soft angles that match the soft swirls of the sky. The last part is the village. The straight lines and the sharp angles divide it from the rest of the painting, seemingly separating it from the heavens of the sky. However, note the dots of the trees rolled through the village, how the spire of the church stretches up to the sky. Van Gogh brings God to the village is one way of looking at it. So some things that characterize his paintings are the use of flat, bright colors, sinuous lines, short, choppy brush strokes. Now here are a couple, um, here's another one of his paintings, um, Starry Night Over the Rhone. So this was painted at the spot on the banks of the river, which was only a minute or two walks from um, the Yellow House, the place Lamartine, uh, which Van Gogh was renting at the time. The night sky and the effects of light at night provided the subject for some of his most famous paintings, including the later canvas from St. Remy, The Starry Night. So here you see an actual photograph on the right bottom side um, where he set up his easel, okay? And then you see on the left his rendering of that starry night over the Rhone. The challenge of painting at night intrigued Van Gogh. The vantage point he chose for starry night over the Rhone allowed him to capture the reflections of the gas lighting in the Arles across the shimmering blue water of the Rhone. In the foreground... There are actually two lovers, and you can see them right here. Um, there are two lovers who stroll by the banks of the river. Here his stars glow with the luminescence, shining from the dark blue and velvety night sky. Dotted along the banks of the Rhone, houses also radiate a light that reflects in the water and adds to the mysterious atmosphere of the painting. Um, we can also see... There's so much texture to this painting, and when you're able to see this close up, 
you really get a sense of, you know, those layers of paint that add some depth and his brush strokes make such a big difference um, in the painting. His paintings of sunflowers, like this one in the middle, are among his most famous. He did them also in Arles in the south of France in 1888 and 1889. He painted a total of five large canvases with sunflowers in a vase with three shades of yellow and nothing else. In this way, he demonstrated that it was possible to create an image with numerous variations of single color without the loss of eloquence. So when you look at this, you see three different shades of yellow. And of course, we've got a, a very minuscule amount of green added um, for those stems of those flowers. The sunflower painting had, paintings had a special significance for Van Gogh. They communicated gratitude, he wrote. He hung the first two in the room of his friend, painter Paul Gauguin, who came to live with him for a while in that yellow house that we've mentioned. Uh, Gauguin was impressed by the sunflowers, which he thought were completely Vincent. Uh, Van Gogh had already painted a new version during his friend's stay, and Gauguin later asked for one of those as a gift, which Vincent was reluctant to give him. He later produced two loose copies, however, one of which is now in the Van Gogh Museum. Here are some other famous. The irises is another famous. Almond blossoms, green field. Um, this one is a, a movement in a moment. And notice those clouds in the movement, okay? A whole different type of movement than we saw in Starry Night. Um, but you will see prints of all of these um, available for, for people to purchase. They're famous today even. Another post-impressionist we've mentioned as being one of Van Gogh's friends, Paul Gauguin, um, he was a leading post-impressionist painter. His bold experiment with coloring led directly to the, the synthesis style of modern art. Um, while his expression of the inherent meaning of the subjects in his paintings under the influence of the cloisonist style paved the way to primitivism and the return to the pastoral. He was also an influential exponent of wood engraving and wood cuts as an art form. Paul Gauguin and Van Gogh, as we mentioned, were friends and living together for a while, but they had a very volatile friendship. In fact, you know, some of you may have heard that, you know, Van Gogh loses an ear and, you know, some people had said he, due to his mental illness, that he cut off his own ear. But there's another story out there that it was one of these volatile arguments that these friends had and that maybe Paul Gauguin is the one that cut off Van Gogh's ear. At any rate, it's still um, a very um, interesting story and an interesting part of Van Gogh's life. So Gauguin abandoned his life in Paris for the role of a civilized savage in Tahiti. So in his art, you see, you know, some of those images from Tahiti. Day of the God in 1897, you see at the bottom. He, in that, he tried to recast nature in an unblemished state. There's nine honey-colored figures that accompany the shores of the tropical island. You see flat, brightly colored shapes. Blue, yellow, and pink form a rhythmic tapestry like patterns recalling the style of Japanese prints and Art Nouveau posters. There's a mood of serenity that seems to prevail, and there's organic reflections in the foreground pool of water, and the fetal positions of the figures on the shore suggest birth and regeneration. Another post-impressionist was Georges Seurat. Um, he was the founder of the 19th century French school of neo-impressionism, whose technique for portraying the play of light using tiny brush strokes of contrasting colors became known as pointillism. Using this technique, he created huge compositions with tiny detached strokes of pure color, too small to be distinguished when looking at the entire work, but making his painting shimmer with brilliance. Um, works in this style include Une Bagnade, Ashneris, and A Sunday on Le Grand Jeté. 
um, you see a picture of Sunday afternoon um, on Le Grand Jaté there on the left, okay? So this concept of pointillism uses tiny dots um, to intensify the color and give the impression of solid form. So when you look at this close-up of the hand that's holding the flowers, okay, you see the tiny dots. Now, when you look at this painting up close, it does not look that great. This is one of those, as so many of the Impressionists, where whether we're talking about new Impressionism or post-Impressionism, you step back and you take a look at this painting from across the room, and it's phenomenal. But you can see these dots, okay, um, and the use of small brush strokes, and it just, the overall image it creates is just a phenomenon. Here are some other um, Surratt paintings. This is Grand Champ, Evening. This is the Eiffel Tower, Bathers in the Water. Again, the use of that pointillism, those little dots. Another famous post-impressionist is Paul Cezanne. He was a French artist and a post-impressionist painter whose work laid the foundation of the transition from that 19th century conception of artistic endeavor to a new and radically different world of art in the 20th century. Cezanne can be said to form the bridge between late 19th century Impressionism and the early 20th century's new line of artistic inquiry, Cubism. The line is attributed to both Matisse and Picasso that Cezanne, quote, is the father of us all, and this cannot be easily dismissed. Cezanne's work demonstrates a mastery of design, uh, color, composition, and draftsmanship. His often repetitive, sensitive, and exploratory brushstrokes are highly characteristic and clearly recognizable. He used planes of color and small brush strokes that built up to form complex fields, at once both a direct expression of the sensations of the observing eye and an abstraction from observed nature. The paintings convey Cezanne's intense study of his subjects, a searching gaze and a dogged struggle to deal with the complexity of human visual perception. So, here we see uh, one of his famous pieces, The Basket of Apples, all right? So, you see a concern. He was very concerned with formal elements over subject matter. He had a desire to give paintings three-dimensionality um, and a pictorial unity. Um, and if you look, I mean, there's great detail to these apples, right? Um, and everything looks very three-dimensional. Some other famous pieces of his, Mont Saint Victoire, okay, and then here's Mont Saint Victoire with large pine, okay, so different images or views, excuse me, of the same um, location. Here's a real picture of that same mountain. Um, and then this one is Bathers at Rest, okay, so you see another um, beautiful piece. <clears throat> Sculpture of the late 19th century. So, Auguste Rodin was a master at capturing <clears throat> the physical vitality of the human figure. One of his earliest works was The Age of Bronze, and you see that depicted in the picture on the slide. And this was so lifelike that critics accused him of forging the figure form uh, from plaster cast of a live model. Um, Rodin augmented realism with an unparalleled sense of organic movement and nervous energy. Uh, modeling form um, rapidly in clay, he would, he would use clay, he recreated the shifting effects of light and dark. His figures achieve this degree of emotional intensity that's absent from the classical and Renaissance sculptures that he so admired. So, realism combined with organic movement and nervous energy. Um, some of his famous pieces beyond the Age of Bronze were The Gates of Hell, The Kiss, and The Thinker. So, let's take a look at some of these. This is The Thinker, and you have seen this replicated so many times, okay? Um, 
the thinker is, um, you know, this guy, he's sitting there, he's resting his chin on his hand, um, and doing a lot of, you know, thinking. It's very philosophical. Um, here you see the kiss. What an emotional embrace. These are called the gates of hell. His landmark work is the gates of hell, and it's a set of monumental bronze doors commissioned in 1880 for a new Paris museum. Now, it was based on that theme of Dante's Inferno, and it was loosely modeled after Ghiberti's Gates of Paradise. You remember we studied those. Um, the doors became the framework for dozens of Rodin's most imaginatively conceived images. The commission was never completed, um, but individual figures such as the thinker and the kiss were recast individually in both bronze and marble to become landmarks in their own right. In the rugged body language of the thinker, he, Rodin captured that drama of intense introspection. So when we think about materialism, um, <clears throat> we think of moral and social consequences. Industrialism and all those technological advances that were associated with it. Um, artists, writers, and composers leave their landmarks that document the realities of their time, the burdens of the laboring class, the pleasures of urban life. There were new technologies in photography. Remember, they, there was lithography, synthetic pigments, cast iron and steel construction. Um, the spirit of heroic materialism dominated the West, while an appreciation of the world beyond the West inspired an exotic turn in the arts. Um, the rampant materialism of the West would usher in dynamic and destructive a dynamic and destructive new era, the 20th century. So this concludes our discussion of chapter 13, materialism. And we're going to be leaving materialism in the next lecture and moving into modernism um, and some modern art, which will be the final chapter we cover in our course. Thank you for joining me for this part two of chapter 13.